Let's look at some examples of photography for the purposes of forensics and physiognomy in the late 19th century. So when we're talking about photography and physiognomy in this period of time, the late 19th century, we're talking about a use of photography that's descended from physical anthropology and is used as an institutional method of documentation for domestic populations. So the French are using it for their own people, French people, and the British are using it for the British people and American for Americans, etc. Physical anthropology held that character traits could be mapped to particular physio physiological measurements, that, the, that a, a certain quality of person is reflected in specific measurements of their skull, of their face, of, of, of things that can be physically measured. This is practical for identity photography, particularly of prisoners. Photographs in this time were used to support and disseminate ideas about eugenics, which was widely popular in Western institutions right up until the Second World War. Now the story of the use of photography in anthropology and colonization is another story. This is just one photograph to reflect that use, the use of photography by Westerners to document the specifics of the bodies of people from non-Western cultures. So this, uh, this photograph is from the late 1860s. One of the ways that photography is used to document physiognomy and to explore physiognomy was by the capturing of photographs of facial expressions. By the way that this was done, the, the specific circumstances by which this was done deserve some attention. What they did was to use electrical currents and electrodes to stimulate facial muscle contractions to create the appearance of emotional expressions. And these photographs that they captured were published in comparison with artistic renditions of emotion. The objective of this was to get scientific, accurate, precise, mechanical records of what facial expressions of emotion were like. Okay, that was the goal. That was what they were trying to do. And this was, uh, when, it, when it went out to the public, it was criticized not because it was too artificial, but because it was too natural. They described it as stripping art of its every ideal and reducing it to an anatomical realism. Oscar Islander um, collaborated in this process. These are the photographs that we're talking about here. And these, uh, the, these photographs um, have been taken out of context and reproduced widely in mainstream culture. So they may already be familiar to you from their use in you know, advertising and record albums and videos and things like that. But this is how and why they were done. They had a patient from an asylum who was not, he, he, he had to do as he was told, okay? He was used as a human subject. And they had these electrodes put to his face to cause the muscular contractions. The people who did this, the scientists who did this, did this because they, they, they were trying to test their understanding of how we express ourselves through our faces. And they're trying to like, like be as specific as they can about which muscles are being activated to express which emotions. Now, when we look at these photographs, they seem horrifying. And it is true that this man is not in control of his own facial expressions, but his facial expressions seem tremendously tortured to us. And uh, the expressions of horror and fear and awe and anguish that they're trying to capture by these muscle contractions, they are being forced upon his face. These are larger photographs from which those illustrations were taken. So here you can see the actual scientists at work, Deshonda Ballone and Oscar Rylander, who's, who's doing the photographic end of this process. So, um, so the, the horror and anguish that you see on, these, uh, on, on the face of this man who is being used as a subject, we can't... Um, we, we're inferring his feeling through these facial expressions that are being artificially stimulated. 
And these photographs make it clear enough that this is an institutional product. Okay, this is the, the, the institution of medicine and pursuit of scientific understanding is using this man as a subject to demonstrate their ideas about how these, uh, how these expressions uh, come about. And then these photographs, in turn, were published in books. Oh, here's a happy one on the left. Yeah, he, you can see his, his, his smile, every bit as artificially stimulated as the expressions of horror that we saw previously. The expression of thoughtfulness on the right, artificially stimulated by the use of, uh, of electrodes on muscles. So, so these photographs documenting what were ostensibly authentic human emotions, they were used um, in, in, uh, in Darwin's publication on the expression of emotion in man and animals. These were some of the other photographs that were used in that publication. And you can see in this diagram, they've sort of separated one side of the face from the other to show how one side of the face could be stimulated um, through electrodes and the other half um, would be unaffected. When we're looking at the use of photography as visual analysis of physical traits from this period, it's important to keep something in mind. The photography was seen in this time as objective by its nature. This was a point in time where people used photography for positivist purposes as proof, as record and data. As a result, photography was abused by being used as proof for ideas that it did not prove. It was, it, it was abused. Physical anthropology held that character traits could be mapped to particular physiological measurements because of differences that developed through evolution. This was used as the basis for bogus race science. Physiological characteristics were seen as evidence of fitness, mental phys fitness, fitness of character on many levels, both for individuals and for various social groups. And photographs were used to support and disseminate ideas about eugenics and race science. So here's Francis Galton, um, or the work of Francis Galton. He himself is not, uh, is not depicted here, but what he did in this set of photographs was to attempt to use the compositing together of many negatives to make a composite portrait of Boston physicians. So you can see several individual photographs of Boston physicians going around the outside, and then the composite made of all of their images sort of blurred together and overlaid in the center. So in Francis Galton's work, he would take many, many photographs of different individuals from different cultural groups, ethnic groups, professional groups, and so on, with the aim to study very, very specifically and very closely different aspects of their facial features. And his endeavor was to determine, for example, whether there were certain facial features that those doctors shared beyond being white men of a certain age. And here, his aim, you can see he's overlapping photographs on the left. There's composites on the left, and then the individual profiles on the right. Here, he's attempting to discern the facial features that are characteristic of the Jewish type. So he's trying to um, substantiate these ideas about facial features that different groups have in common. And he extended this to taking many, many photographs of individuals who had been arrested for various crimes and then compositing those photographs together and comparing them to composite photographs that he had made from different professions in medicine, for example, as you saw, and people in the military, as you're seeing here, comparing them in an effort to prove his idea that criminals had for facial features that told us who they were. The idea was that by studying these facial features, you could know what kind of a person this person was and that they may have a propensity for certain kinds of crimes, for example. So here's a photographer who worked more specifically in um, forensic photography. Alphonse Bertillon developed a system of measurements, um, measurements that would be unique to each individual. 
his methods were intimately connected to theories of physiological anthropology, to ideas that he shared with Galton, who we were looking at before. Bertillon believed that photography could be used as a supplement to this measurement system, that it would capture information um, much more richly and precisely and, uh, and, and with less of a margin of error than, uh, than individual measurements of these things. So photography was practical in that way. And then ultimately, those photographs ended up becoming more useful on their own as identifying documents themselves, not just for the measurements that they captured, but as photographs of what a whole face looked like. So as a result, Bertillon becomes the inventor of the mugshot. And here is just such a mugshot of Bertillon himself. So he made a self-portrait as what they called a Bertillon card. He made these photographs of himself, and then you see the, the measurements that are marked on the top area of the, of the card. Um, those are records of specific areas of the face. He had a whole system for measuring certain areas of the face and then recording those measurements. Originally, again, those measurements were the point, because he believed that, uh, th that you could keep very precise records and that those records would reflect qualities of the physiognomy that reflected character traits. But in the process of using the photograph to to verify those records, then those photographs end up being very useful um, identification documents on their own. And here's a whole collection of photographs that Bertillon captured. This is used as a synoptic table of the forms of the nose. So these are, these are profile photographs of different nose types. They're photographs of specific individuals, but he's using them as diagrams of nose types. This illustration shows how some of those measurements would have been taken um, in order to get this sort of comprehensive reference document of the individual. You can see how the photograph provides much more um, precise data than these specific measurements would be able to on their own. And he made a lot of these photographs. So we have some, uh, some nose types documented on the left, ear types documented on the right. Lots and lots of these photographs. And then these photographs would be brought together in these reference tables that, uh, that people in the police force and, and, uh, and, and other people who worked in forensics could study and use as their references for keeping records of the features of, uh, of people who were in prison. Here's another set of those reference images, ears on the top, eyes on the bottom. So then these photographs would be used to train police officers. And here we have a photograph of such a training taking place um, 1910 to 1915. Here you see a demonstration of a few different uses of photography that Bertillon put to use. And on the left, um, that sort of staging of the identity documentation. And on the right, a uh, way that he put things together in order to photograph crime scenes. So you've got a tripod with super long legs. There's a, there's a mirror used with that so that the camera wouldn't have to actually be on top of that tripod, but could, uh, could put the mirror to use instead. So Bertillon devises this whole system originally as a way of keeping the kinds of records that, um, that demonstrate and put to use these principles of, uh, of physical anthropology, these, uh, the, these beliefs that the um, physiognomy of the person will reflect what kind of person they are. The pictures are taken to document people who have been arrested, specific individuals. And then the data is taken from those individuals, but we still are looking at the faces of actual people. So these faces become an archive of faces who, what we know about them is that they have been brought into this sort of institution of, uh, of, of crime study and crime management and, and policing and incarceration.
the process of using photographs to document people who have been arrested and brought into the criminal justice system that spreads very quickly across the United States. So this is um, this is a photograph, a couple of photographs of Claude F. Hankins, as you can see, labeled murderer. He was 14 years old when he was uh, convicted, and these photographs were taken. Claude Hankins shows up in other places in the, the archives of photography. Um, this one's from San Quentin from 1909. Since photographs are of people and not just of data, they end up telling much, much more than they were originally created to record.